tu es digne de louange, c'est toi qu'on te vraiment, tu es digne de louange. C'est toi qui compte vraiment, tu es digne de louange. C'est toi qui compte vraiment, tu es digne de louange. Alléluia. Father, you're the one who counts on me. You're worthy of all praise. Today, Yesterday you were, today you are, and you will always be forevermore worthy of all praise. So we want to give you all the glory today, all the way, all, all the glory, all the worship. Let our gratitude come to you today, for you are the one who really counts. Every all, all of the men try to count, but unfortunately, and I've only, I wouldn't be saying, fortunately they do not count. We do not count, fortunately. Because you are the one who really counts. You're the one worthy of all praise, worthy of all adoration. That's why we come to you today and we say, Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty was and is and is to come. We say, All honor, all glory, all power, all glory, all grace belong to you. Take all the glory. Take all the glory. Take all the power. Take all the honor. It belongs to you, only you. Receive it fully. Receive the glory. Receive the honor. Receive the power. Receive the whole. Let my hallelujah belong to you. All the hallelujah belong to you. All the honor belong to you. Everything, all that celebrity fame belong to you. All the well-knownness belong to you. Receive the glory. Receive the praise. This word is your word. This grace is your grace. This time is your time. This moment is your moment. This season is your season. This meeting is your meeting. This teaching is your teaching. This Bible is your Bible. This instrument is your instrument. This voice is your voice. This heart is your heart. This body is your body. This church is your church. Therefore, nothing shall separate us from your love because everything belongs to you. Receive the glory, Father. Receive the glory, Father. In the name of Jesus, we have prayed. Father, make me, I make myself so small. I have nothing but how small I am. So receive the glory and be the big one, the great one, the great God, the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Be the great God, please. I do not want that glory. Take it off. In the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for wisdom in this teaching and wisdom, wisdom in understanding. For myself, yes, for my brothers and sisters too. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hello, everyone. So thank you for joining. Thank you for being here. The Lord is here. Hallelujah. By the grace. And we're going to get into this teaching today that is entitled, My Work Speak for God. En français, ce sera mes œuvres parlent pour Dieu. My work speak for God. Amen. So let's go into um, Esther. The book of Esther is going to be around the book of Esther today. The book of Esther in the chapter 6. Amen. It's written, That night the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought to him and read to him. It was found recorded that, that recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bictana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. And he says, what honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. 
The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the other court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows he had erected for him. Verse five, his attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought himself, who is there that the king will rather honor than me? <laughs> so Haman was really thinking like a lot, a, 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 as him like a, an important person. He was an important in the kingdom, but he was thinking of him like so important that he deserved that honor. Amen. And we see later that there was somebody who did not think like that, so he was honored. Let's continue. So he answered the king, for the men the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him this. What? Proclaiming before him this. This is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Verse 10, go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. Verse 11, so Haman, Haman, so Haman, okay, got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on the horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Verse 12, afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends about what had happened to him. His advisors and his wife Zeresh said to him, since Mordecai, before whom downfall has started, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. He will surely come to reign. While they were still talking with him, the king Genix arrived and hurried Haman about the banquet Esther had prepared. And if we go to verse chapter seven, we understand better the story. Let me see, read it quickly. It says, so the king Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And as they were drinking wine, on that second day, the king answered, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. Hallelujah. What is your request? Even up to the half of my kingdom, it will be granted. Verse three, then Queen Esther answered, if I had found favor with you, O king, and if it pleases you, majesty, grant me my life. This is my petition and spare my people. This is my request, hallelujah. For I and my people have been sold for destruction and slaughter and annihilation. If we had merely been sold as male or female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress will justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman realized 
But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind the bed to, to beg Queen Esther to, for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman, as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king explained, will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word of as soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Arbona, one of the king's units, attending the king, said, A gallows of a gallows 75 feet high stands by Haman's house. He had, it, he had made it for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, hang him on it. So they hanged him on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. So we see here that all this is happening. But if you look very well, all those stuff are happening because God used one man. His name is Mordecai. What did Mordecai do? He helped the king because there were two guys called one called Big Big Tana and another one called Teresh, who I think were paid by him. And I don't know exactly, you know, in the representation they had they had foreseen to kill the king, to poison him and kill him. No, not to poison him, but to kill him in, in the night. And this is what happened. Mordecai heard it. And he went ahead and told the king's eunuchs, the king's squad, that something was about to happen. And that's why things were able not to happen. Amen. A second thing he did is that when he heard that Haman wanted to kill the entire Jewish, commun Jew Jewish community, he went to Esther and he said, you can't let our people die. He started to beg. He removed, he shared his clothes. He slept in front of the, of, of the palace on the floor just to beg for the life and pray and supply for the life of the Jewish people. Amen. So now let's take a little bit of background on Mordecai. Mordecai was not the uncle of Esther, but he was his cousin. He was her cousin. Amen. He was the cousin of Queen Esther. If we go to chapter 2, verse 7, we see that it is written that Mordecai had a cousin named Adassa. That's Queen Esther first. The name is her, her real name. Her, 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 her birth name is Adassa. Whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This girl who was also known as Esther was lovely in form and features. And Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. So he was his, she was his cousin. So basically, he didn't really have a parental obligation towards her. He had the obligation of a brother, maybe, but not of a parent. So he, he could not, he didn't have to take off her like a daughter. But he decided to do so. And the Bible precise even as his own daughter. So he didn't make a difference between children if he had some and his and her. She was his child, his daughter. Wherever she was gone, this is my father. This is my daughter. The same thing happens now with spiritual father. Sometimes uh, the, the son, spiritual son, or somebody lives with his aunt or with his uncle, and wherever they go, when they ask, uh, when they ask the parent or the uncle or the aunt, she was, he or she will say, this is my daughter, or this is my son. Approximately, it's, it's the same thing, it's almost the same thing. Mordecai decided that there shall not be a difference. And he decided, let's say, 
not to steal her youth, her childhood, because she became often early. So he could have said, oh, you're often. Nobody is going to pay for your stuff. Go and work. But he didn't say that. He said, I'll take care of you like my own daughter. Amen. Mordecai wasn't her father. Mordecai was even closer to being the brother of, of Esther. He was her cousin. But he decided to embrace the role of a father and raise a child that wasn't his. He raised the queen. Do you see the difference? There's a difference between raising a child and raising a queen. He raised somebody who was ready to take a responsibility, mature enough to be a queen, mature and humble enough to be a queen. He did not just raise a daughter. He, just, just, he did not just raise a woman. He raised the queen. And how did he raise a queen? It's because of his heart. We're not talking about a queen that's just about, that's just about beauty and fashion. We're talking about a queen that is responsible, mature, and hardworking. And know this and have a sense of sacrifice for others. We just read how it happened that, that King Xerxes said, you, you, King Xerxes uh, had him and being hanged to, to hallows. It's because of the heart that Esther had. And if you check, that heart is coming from Mordecai. We'll understand one in, why in a few minutes. Amen. Hallelujah. So Mordecai is primary, the name of Mordecai, the primary meaning is follower or worshiper of Mother or of Mars, if you want, the planet. But it also means little man. Little man. The Bible will say, the kingdom of God belongs to those who are li like little children. That's what Mordecai was. Amen. So let's go a little bit into his characteristic character. What was Mordecai known for? Well, first he was an elder in the Jewish community in uh, the, the citadel of Susa. So like the main city of, of um, the place where they were right now, I think it's what it was Babylon. He was one of the good figures of the Jewish community in that place. He wasn't working inside the, he was working at the palace, but he wasn't involved in every bad thing in the palace. He was an elder in the Jewish community, meaning that he was an elder in the community of God, the people of God. Amen. That was his position. Second thing, he was very kind-hearted. You can see throughout the thing that he took somebody, he took an orphan, he gave her food, he raised her. Then he saw a king that was about to be killed. He said, oh no, I can't do that. He didn't really care about the king position. But the king, the kingship of, of that man was, is an important factor for what's about to happen later. But he didn't really care about the social status. He was like, this man is about to be killed. I need to do something. When he heard that an entire community, an entire uh, community of Jewish is, was about to be killed all around the, the kingdom, he said, no, I can't do that. Let me go and sleep in front of the, of the palace. He was kind-hearted. Amen. Nowadays, he's known as Esther's parental figure. He's the one who saved the life of King Xerxes. That's how he's known now. He's known now. He's a man of valor, a man of sacrifice. Because all that he has done was about sacrifice. Mordecai wasn't the richest, but he was a righteous man. Hallelujah. Mordecai wasn't the richest, but he was a righteous man. Haman was rich, but was not righteous. Haman was full of, of vice, full of bad things full of anger, full of, of bitterness. But Mordecai was not the richest, but he was righteous. He was full of love. He loved people. 
So now let's take a look a little bit at Mordecai's work. What did he do? First thing he did was hospitality. Because the first thing we hear about him is that he was the practice hospitality. He welcomed an orphan in his house and took care of her like his own daughter. He's also a militant for Christ's people. He went to the highest institutions for the Lord's people to be set free and not, into, and not to be killed. He's another one of his work is a man of truth. He's truthful. He's full of truth. He told the truth about what Big Tan and Teresh did when they tried to kill King Cersei. Somebody would tell me, oh, but he didn't tell the truth when Esther was in there. But when we read what happens, God had ordained it like that. He made a mistake. He sinned once. Yes, but it's a man. True. But God has ordained it so that it shall happen in that way. Another of his works is that he's a protective man. He has protection. He protects other people. He protected Esther during all those years without looking at her past, nor envying her future. He didn't envy the fact that she was in the palace. Actually, he was so happy. The Lord actually allowed him to be to, to use it, if you want, to save the Lord's people. He was a man of justice. So why is it so important to, to go through Mordecai's life and character? Well, the only thing is that Mordecai is an example for Christianity, of Christianity in action, Christianity in heart. He's an example for all of us. He must be an example for all of us because what he did was really, really impressive. And we see the heart of God, the actions of God, the way of doing things of God in the way he acts. God is ready to, to, to save us from anything as long as we know who he is and as we love him. If, and even if we don't love him, he loves us so much that he will come and save us. So let me read a little bit more about him in the book of Esther. If we go to Esther chapter two, let's read from verse five to seven, it's written, now there was in the citadel of Susa, a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those then, among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, Jeho, Jeho king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Adassi, whom he had brought up because she had never, she had, she had neither father nor mother. This girl, this girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features. And Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. If we go to verse 10, it is written, Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day her, he walked back and forth near the court of Esther to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. If we go to the verse 19 to 23, we see another way he helped her, another way he was. When it's written, when the virgins were assembled, second time Mordecai was sitting in the king's gate. This is where he saved the life of the king. But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do, for she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when, when he was bringing her up. Verse 21, during the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bictana and Tiresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Cersei. Verse 22, but, but, but Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported to it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when 
the report was investigated and found to be true. The two officials were hanged on, on the gallows. All this was recorded in the book of Annals in the presence of the king. If you go to chapter four, verse one and two, another character of Mordecai, when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, wow. And went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly, verse two, but he went only as far as the king's gate because he, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. And he did so because an entire race, an entire generation of Jewish was about to be killed. They were about to be erased from the earth. He did all the sacrifices for Esther, for the king, for his people. And after all the sacrifices, we saw at the beginning of chapter 6 that he was honored by the king. And he was honored, he was dressed in a royal robe on a, on a royal horse. And they say, this is, and they took him all around the city saying, this is how the king is to treat people who saved his life. The one who saved his life. And you realize this, and maybe agree with me, that the honor didn't come when he was expecting it, but he came when the king said so. Amen. The honor of man can be good, but it will destroy you. It will destroy us. Example of Haman. Haman was a wealthy person, but he had an entourage that would praise him, but nobody came to his rescue when he was dying. Nobody came to help him when he was about to be hanged up. Hanged up. Mordecai, more than a savior, he was a man of justice. He couldn't accept that people would have died freely for one man's sake, for heaven's sake. Amen. So let's go a little bit deeper in this. <clears throat> the life of Mordecai speaks a lot about the kind of Christian we must be. Mordecai's life wasn't the one of a billionaire, of course. Like, he didn't have a lot of money. But his life was the one of a man who has a good and great heart. He saw the danger and decided to stand up for the Lord's people. He saw and heard of a plan against a man, against King Xerxes. Or even before the, being the king, he saw a plan against a man. And even so, I think God had not have, must have speak, spoken to him because I'm sure he saw that Haman was trying to get that position. That's what this was happening. And even though the king wasn't Christian, he spoke the truth and the life of the king was preserved. Hallelujah. We're talking here about a man whose heart was not for himself, but was for others and especially was for God. That's the type of Christian that we must be. Men and women whose hearts are not for themselves, but for others, but especially for God. Amen. So here's why we are talking about all that. First Corinthians 13, verse 2, it's written, If I have the gift of prophecy and can fat home all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith, that can move mountains, but do not have love. I am nothing. Mordecai is showing us that, hey, you're, we are Christians, true. But let's practice that Christianity. Push that love to another level. Take hardship. Take endurement. Enduring st stuff for others. Accept that. And you shall see the glory, the honor of God in your life. That's what he's telling us. Mordecai's heart was a heart full of love. And see, that love wasn't choosing whom he would help based on Christianity or based on skin color or based on social status. A lot of us do that today, especially the racist part. 
lot of us, we love based on skin color. We do things based on skin colors, based on social status. But Monica is showing us here that we must help people. Not because of, the, of all that, of their social status, of their skin color, of the fact that they're Christian and no, not because we think that they deserve it, but we just help people because they need it and because the Lord would have told us the same. Because the love, because God loved them. Amen. And that's the only time when God can come and tell us, come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and I was looking and, and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. The Lord will always able to tell us that when we will understand that it's not about a characteristic or not about a social or a worldly, or worldly uh, 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 um, how can I say that? Worldly classification that we must love and help others is about what God says we must do. And he said in his word to love one another as he loves us. The heart of a Christian is not a heart of, a, it's not a heart of discrimination. It doesn't discriminate others because of their belief or because of their lifestyle and all their lifestyle. The heart of a Christian loves one another. But the Bible says so. The Bible says this, a new command that gives you love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. A man of God once said that in the Old Testament, God asked his people to love the neighbor, their neighbor as they love themselves. But now in the new covenant, God is saying this. He said, love one another as I have loved us. So the Lord is saying, do not love people anymore as you love yourself. But now start to love them as I loved them. In Exodus, he said, love one another. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, in the book of John, he comes and says, love one another as I have loved you. So Mordecai understood that before even it was spoken to us. And let me tell you this, maybe God was telling those people before, love your neighbor as yourself, because he knew that we are his image. So if we love them as ourselves, we love them as, we, as the Lord we have inside us. But with the time changing, God had to give another instruction. Why? More specific, because he saw that hatred was being, was being uh, uh, put out in the world, in the society. And he said, no, I can't do that. Today is telling us, love one another as I have loved you. When God loves, it doesn't make a difference. The only difference God, God makes, let me tell you in the Bible, he says, the only difference he makes is when he's talking about the day of his return. When he says, as, when he said, uh, uh, I will make a difference between those who serve me and those who don't serve me. He's talking about the day of his return. He's not saying you don't love those who don't serve me. He don't say that. He's saying, love everybody as I loved you. Me, I will come and make a difference. But you, love. That's what he's saying. Our, wor our works will be for God when we will start to love one another as God loves us. My God. Hallelujah. Amen. But on the earth, as we are living and co-living, we must love each other as God himself loves us. Amen. So we won't get into details 
about God's love because we all know 1 Corinthians 13, talking about how God loves is patient, forgiving, good, patient, kind heart. No, oh, we all know that. But let's just reflect on ourselves and check if we all apply this type of law where we do not discriminate people because of who they are, because of what they do. And ask ourselves, Let's ask ourselves this question, this the following question, and say, am I ready to accept, to love Christ, from, to love like Christ from now on? Am I ready to accept, to love like Christ from now on? Am I ready to accept, to love like Christ from now on? Amen. Amen. My words must reflect God's love. If my works are not full of the love of God, they are not from God and they cannot represent God. Amen. May God bless you. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? Father, first we want to give thanks and glory to God. Father, thank you for your grace, your glory, your master. Thank you, majesty, for your love, for your presence. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Do we have any questions? Hello, Auntie Deidre. How are you doing? Hello. Thank you, Brother E. And do you have any question, any comment? No. Mm -mm, confirmation. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> we are, we are dis disciples. We have to walk and talk it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's just pray together. Let's pray together. Let's pray together and ask God to help us accept not to discriminate, accept not to put that difference in between people that do not need to be there. Accept, mm -hmm. let's, let us accept not to, not to say that person is Jewish, that person is black, that person is white, that person is rich, that person is part of, of white supremacy, that person mm -hmm. is Democrat, that person is libertarian. Let's stop with that and let's just be like Mordecai. We did not look at the status of the queen at, or at the status of the king. Uh, we did not look at how much, how much people around him may have been hard to him, but he said, Lord, I'll fight for those people. Lord, I'll love those people. So Father, help us not to look at what people had done. Help us not to look at how people look. Help us not to look at their lifestyles. Help us not to look at what they are. Help us not to look at what they have done, at who they are. But Father, help us please, to love them, to cherish them, to help them. Just because you ask us to do it, and because we love you first. He says, seek you first the kingdom of God and all of the things shall be given unto you. We will seek you first. Then, Father God, that love shall be given to us so that we might do your work without discrimination, so that we might do your work without problems. We ask for the same thing for new beginning ministries. In this ministry, remove the discrimination, remove all those things. If that was stopping us from growing, Father, break that cycle, break that discrimination, break all that, and let your grace, your glory, your power, your might, your people come in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, please touch your heart, for you are the only one who can go on in your heart and sunder it. Go in your heart and check for what is inside. If anything wrong is inside, remove it in your mighty name. Please, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed. We cover this with the blood of Jesus. Amen. I want to ask you, do you have a prayer point? I will stop the recording. I feel like praying for you. <laughs>